Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's really great to be here again. So, uh, Yuri asked me to talk about uh, proof search, and uh, I'm planning to talk about a toolkit that we have for construction of extensible proof search tactics. So, let me first give you just a little bit of the background. So, uh, uh, this talk is uh, is based on the Netherball system that uh, we have been developing over the last eight years or so, and uh, I will talk about the uh, proof search capabilities that we have in the system. And there are two main uh, clients of that. Uh, one of them is the Netherball Interactive Theorem Prover, and another is a Mojave Netherpro compiler which uh, could be kind of surprising. It's kind of obvious why you need proof search in a, in a theorem prover, and probably much less obvious why would you want to do a compiler based on a proof search system. But actually, it turns out to be uh, really nice and useful, and hopefully I will get a chance to talk uh, to, to explain why. So here is an overview of what I'm planning to talk, but if you have questions and if you want me to go into more detail about something other than this, uh, so please feel free to interrupt me because there are a lot of different branches of this that I can go into. And basically, uh, the, my plan is to give you some idea of how we view proof search in our system and uh, explain some of the issues that come up and then show you how, how we solve some of them. And I will focus sort of on a um, on kind of user tactic implementers interface of how does it look when you use these mechanisms. And so, but if you want to know a bit more about how these things are implemented, so either ask me or I can look at the papers that give details. And then, of course, I'll, I'll try to give as many examples as possible to demonstrate how this all uh, looks from concrete examples. So, first let me uh, tell you a bit of, about tactics. So, tactics is sort of a standard mechanism that first appeared in the LCF prover and back in 79. It's a mechanism for making sure that even if you have a buggy proof search algorithm, that no matter what it does, if you get something that looks like a proof, then it must be a valid proof. And a basic idea is that uh, the system will have some set of axioms and logical rules and so forth. Uh, so some systems have just a built-in predefined set. Some systems, such as our Metapro, allow users to add their own rules. And uh, the system will then make sure that the only way to build a proof is by using one of those predefined rules. It then will provide a meta language uh, for coding proof search and for building proofs uh, it using so called tactics. And the guarantee is that the only way the tactic can modify the proof state is by applying one of the rules, which means that if all the rules and axioms are correct, no matter how wrong your tactic is, if it managed to build a proof, that it must be a valid proof. And uh, if you think about it even more generally, 
uh, the, the way to think about it is that you have some piece of data that you're uh, uh, concerned about, and you have some relatively small set of allowable transformations. And, and so one example is uh, as an interior improver where the the piece of data that you're concerned about is your partial proof that you're building, and allowable transformations are the logical rules that can be used to, uh, to, to build those proofs. And another interesting example, and this kind of starts to show how the compiler work comes into it, is when the piece of data that you're concerned about is, is a program, and you have some set of transformation transformations that we're allowed to make to that program. And then you have tactics, which is just the guidance code for making those transformations. In case of a theorem prover, tactics would be a proof search. Uh, the tactics would be proof search algorithms. In case of a compiler, tactics will be essentially the compiler itself or parts of the compiler or stages of the compiler that use the allowable program transformations to actually translate the program from source language to target language. And the guarantee is, again, that tactics can be arbitrarily wrong, but if, in case of a compiler, if you get an assembler program or at the end, and if you trust all the individual program transformations, then even if the rest of the compiler is very buggy, you can still trust that the resulting program is equivalent to the original program. And so let me uh, give you some idea of, of how the very basic uh, language for constructing tactics looks like. Well, the, the very basic building block is that for each rule that you have, for, so in, in case of a theorem prover for which axiom, definition, theorem, and so forth, that you add to the system. The system will give you a primitive tactic for applying the rule. For example, if you add something simple like an introduction rule uh, for conjunction, then the system will give you an in and intro tactic. And what an intro tactic does is if your current proof obligation is a conjunction, then by applying the end intro tactic, you get to replace the, uh, the, uh, the proof obligation with two, as we call them, sub-goals, one for proving A and another for proving B. Uh, and then, in, then there are some very um, simple combinators, like the, you can sequence tactics, so uh, this will apply the first tactic and then apply the second tactic on all the sub goals. Uh, you can give a list of tactics and tell it to apply the first one that can be actually applied successfully. You can just give an identity that leaves your proof the, over your partial proof the way it is. Uh, the punty is a way to just embed arbitrary. Uh, proof search procedure in the underlying language. Basically, if you give a, it a function that looks at what it is that you're trying to prove and construct and constructs a tactic based on that, essentially um, it's an arbitrary camel function that takes a proof obligation as an input and gives a tactic, then fun t of that is a new tactic that essentially embeds that uh, that proof search algorithm. And all of this is very standard, and most or probably all tactic-based provers will have some, some language like this for building tactics. So I guess the only uh, not completely standard thing about how this is done in Metaprol is that Metaprol provides a way to transparently distribute the proof search. So, for example, if here, if you're using the distributed uh, proof search, which we normally don't because things are normally so fast that 
it doesn't really matter. But if you're using distributed proof storage and say tag one generates several sub goals, then you can run tag two in parallel on all these sub goals. And even here, you can run a few of those tactics in parallel so that uh, if, for example, the later you, it turns out that the first one fails, you already have the result of the second one that you can use right away. But other than that, this is all pretty standard, and this doesn't really give you that much just yet. So the only thing that it gives you is this guarantee that um, even a buggy tactic uh, can do no wrong, provided all your inference rules are correct. But it doesn't help you in writing the algorithms in any way. And it turns out that once you have the rules already in your system, the, even just the rules themselves already have a lot of information about how you would want to use them. And uh, it turns out that you, that there are some very common, uh, there are some very common tasks that you want to be able to do and you need support for those. So in order to better understand what it is that I'm saying here, let me give you a concrete example. So most of my examples are from the case of theorem proving and more or less first order logic, not because it's so important to be able to do, well, necessarily that important that it's here improving first order logic is just because these are examples that are relatively easy to understand. Um, so one, one problem that uh, comes up if you're using a system like that interactively is that having to remember the name of all the primitive tactics is really painful. You don't want to remember that the tactics for uh, introducing the uh, the conjunction is called and intro or whatever it is called. And one of the very trivial simplification that was added to about 15 years ago to the new pro, which is the system that's predecessor to our metaphor system, is a decomposition tactic. And what decomposition tactic does is that you point it either, either at the conclusion of your current proof obligation or at one of the hypotheses of the current proof obligation and it picks up the correct um, the, the correct inference rule to just decompose the top level operator. Essentially it's just a, a, a way not to have to remember all, all those silly names. Uh, and so here are a couple examples of what the decomposition tactic would uh, would would do. Right. That's that's a good question, and so it, uh, there are there are different ways to deal with it. No. So one one of them is to have a mechanism where the caller tells uh, which of the options should be used. Uh, another is when you uh, when you tell the tactic that these are the rules, there is a default one. But the point is, is uh, so one important point is that uh, D does not just go ahead and look at everything that the system has. It has some notion of which are the rules that it should be applying. And if you think about about how you would go about implementing something like this, uh, one uh, one obvious way is to use this fun t functionality. To just write a lookup function that takes uh, takes a look at what the current proof obligation is, uh, figures out what the correct uh, rule is for that particular uh, operator, and just apply it. But the problem is. Um, it's basically extensibility and scoping if you just do it this way. When you add new definitions, new theorems, and so forth, then these decomposition tactics 
needs to be updated so that it knows how to decompose this new definition you just added. And um, you can just go ahead and modify the code every time that you add something new, but that's uh, not very nice. And users, understandably, are too lazy to do, to do this whenever they add a definition. And another problem is, uh, is that uh, in our system, instead of just having one theory that includes everything, we have a hierarchy of theories. Uh, and so that which allows us to formalize different unrelated theories or formalize different related theories and then uh, show how they are related to one another. And in this example, uh, theory A uh, might be, say, uh, first order logic and theory B adds say existential quantifier, theory C adds universal quantifier, theory D combines them together. Or in case of a compiler, theory A could, uh, could be a theory that explains how to compile some core language and theory B explains how to add booleans to that language. Theory C explains how to add integers to that language. And, uh, uh, theory D explains how they add operations that compare integers, which obviously depends on both integers and booleans, and and so forth. And when you have something like that, you need some way to make sure that when you're working, say, in theory B, then your decomposition tactic would use the rules that belong to theory B or possibly theory A, but it would not try to pick rules from unrelated theories. And because if the theories are completely unrelated, that other rule from a different theory can be just completely incorrect in the theory you're working on. And the way we solve it is by adding a notion of resource. And a resource is essentially a collection of data that's called according to this theory hierarchy. And at each location in the, uh, in the theory, in the theory hierarchy, it collects, it gives you an easy access to the collection of all the data that uh, was added uh, sort of above this location in this theory hierarchy. And in Metaperl, this decomposition tactic is implemented uh, using a pair of resources. One resource collects, intro resource collects a pairs of a pattern and an introduction rule or tactic, and the link collects a pair of a pattern and elimination tactic. And for example, if A just defines a true constant, then uh, and adds a pattern says that if you're trying to prove true, just use the true intro rule. Um, over here, the theory, theory B defines conjunction, and it says if, you, if your goal looks like a conjunction, then use this and intro and so forth. The resource mechanism will collect it correctly, and so the D will now know what's the right set of rules and right set of patterns to use in a particular theory. And so you don't really have to understand all this. This is the only slide that I have that actually shows things in Metaprol source format. Uh, but the, the basic idea is that if you're if you're not interested in defining your resource, if you're just a user that's interested in adding things to an existing resource, this is the only thing that has to be written. So if you, if you want to uh, add to intro resource the, the piece of data that says that if your conclusion has this conjunction form, then use and intro, then this is what you have to write. 
But even that seems a bit redundant. Oh, but, yeah, so, sorry. But, uh, so let me, uh, so before I talk about redundancy, let me say something different. So basically the way, uh, the way it works is that when, when to create a new resource, essentially a resource creator has to provide essentially an OCaml expression that defines how to process the collected data. Uh, basically, you need to say what's an empty value, you need to say how to add a single item to an existing collection, and needs to say, well, once you collect all the things, how do you get uh, what you want to get out of it? And knowing that this just said add a single item, and the internal mechanism will make sure that uh, the right uh, the right items will be added in the right order. And uh, obviously, um, and so, in a, so, and even that is not very necessary because uh, Metaprobe provides helper functions to do this and it provides efficient, efficient implementation of term lookup tables so that you can very easily be lookup tables out of the collection of patterns, and patterns can be second order, nested, and so forth. And But still, as I said, uh, one of the sort of problems that we're trying to solve is that users are lazy. And even if you just require a user to write something like this in order to tell, well, this is the, this new introduction rule is the rule that you need to be using to, for decomposing conjunctions, Still, if you think about it, this part is kind of redundant. So it's obvious that if you add in this rule, that this is the pattern. You already have it here. Why repeat it? It's obvious that uh, the thing that you want to be using is the rule itself, the whole point. You just added the rule. So the only non-redundant piece of information is that intro word over here that says this is the rule um, and that uh, that you want to be using. And even that, so you can look at this suffix and use that, but, uh, and this, this is an approach that NewPro used, but we decided that we don't want to assign any special meaning to the names of the rules. So we want names to be just identifiers. So we decided that we don't want to do it this way. So, we, so you still, even though you called it intro, you still have to tell the system that you want the corresponding data to be added to the introduction rule. And so what we allow people to do is to just use resource annotation. So annotation looks like this, where this says, this is the, this is the default introduction rule for whatever this rule is introducing. And you can give it an option, a list that's usually empty, but a list of any additional information about how you want this rule to be used. Yeah. In this case, we got the two goals you want. Yeah. Well, the, the, the way we build proofs is from goal towards the leaves. So when you apply a rule, you always mean to apply a rule to something that looks like this. And these are what, and whatever, sub, whatever assumptions you have in the rule, they correspond to sub-goals that will be generated. Yeah, there are there are some, essentially there. Sometimes you need to give additional information, and I will show an example of that in one in, in a slide or two. But but yeah, so here is one example, and this is going back to your question: Well, what do you do if one of my rule applies? And yeah, 
Well, cut elimination is not a decomposition role, but yeah, how do you deal with something like that when you need to be able to provide more information? So let's first do an easy example where you only need one bit of extra information, which is uh, if you just add both of those rules to intra, the way it's set up is that whatever rule added is added the latest, it will be used. And this makes sense if you're when you're developing your theory, you, you might first prove some very weak rule, and you want to immediately add it, so some weak theorem, and you want to immediately add it to a resource so that you can use it to prove more interesting theorems. And once you prove a more interesting theorem, you add it to re the more interesting theorem to the resource, and that's shadowing the old and sillier one. Um, and, but here, obviously, this is not what you want. When you add this rule, you don't want to shadow this. You really want some way to be able to say you're using one or the other. And the way it works is that here you use this uh, list of options, and you say, well, this rule is one of a group that you can select from, and this is the first selection option and the second selection option. And then there is cell T that runs whatever tactic you give it, telling it whenever you need to make a choice, choose the first option, or whenever you make you need to make a choice, choose the second option. Uh, here is another example, and this is similar to that cut rule example when you need to instantiate a quantifier. So. And here, just if you just 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 stating this rule is not enough to tell the system what it needs to do when the rule is applied. So even before this this whole stuff about resources and so forth comes into play, uh, even the basic exist intro won't be a simple tactic, but it will be the, the primitive tactic that corresponds to this rule is actually a function that takes a term t and uses it to basically gives you a tactic that um, instantiates the existential quantifier with the given term. And to add it to intra, you still don't have to do anything. You just say, well, I want to use this as the default introduction rule for, um, for existentials. But then whoever uses the decomposition will need to say what exactly they want to use for this T. There is with T uh, that does this. And of course, again, uh, so you will use the same with T whether you're uh, applying an existential introduction rule or if, if you're um, instantiating a universal quantifier in one of your hypotheses, or in many other cases. Essentially, yeah. So this is the central argument to a rule. And here is another example when uh, you, you, might, you might need to give information. If you say you have a theory of the untyped lambda calculus, you'll have a rule of, of this form. And, um, and then, so the problem is, is when you're proving sometimes this form, you don't have A. So you need to, in order to apply this rule, you need to pass it the term argument to be used for this type A. So you could still just annotate it with simple intro without any options, and then have whoever calls the decomposition rule on something like this have to provide the appropriate type. But in this case, this is not what you want to do, because just by looking at the rule, you know where the type should be coming from. You know that if you just, if you had some way to infer the type of x, even if it's just a heuristic that can sometimes fail, 
but it's still worth trying. So if there is a way to infer the type of x, this is the term that you want to be using. And the way you say it, well, it's just this. Uh, is, um, so all the black stuff is literally how you type it into a manifold and just for this. This will be, the, the, instead of this, you will use the metaphor syntax for inputting math. But it just says, you, this is added as a default introduction rule for proving that an application has a certain type. And then, uh, so in order to create an appropriate argument, just try inferring the type of X. And it, so when you write it, the system will figure out that this x is the same as this x. It will know, when you're actually applying, it will know how to figure out what corresponds to that x and so forth. And now you can just again, you, um, do decomposition. It will do all the right thing. And you can still use the same with t to overwrite it. So if you, if you over here, if you use with C, it will it will not do type inference and instead will use the type that you give to it. But by default, if you don't give it any type, it will do type inference. Yeah. If you if you want if if either if you gave it an X so complicated that it that whatever heuristics you have for inferring the type fail, or um, if yeah, if you want to use a subtype of it or for some other reason. And, and in fact, going back to the compiler case, so there are the, uh, for the type language where you don't need to uh, do any type entries, but uh, once for the compiler, uh, so the, com the compiler right now is for essentially an ML-like language. And after you do type inference, you want to do type checking. And the way type checking is implemented in the compiler is that there are a bunch of rules of this form. They're all added to intro. And the, uh, the, the type inference stage of the compiler, the tactic part of it, just says repeat DT0 until you have nothing left. And if you have something left, that's a type error. You assume you know what A is. The, yeah, so for the, if your proof obligation is only that was below the line that was moving in front of the left. Right, right. So so in so right. In the, in this case we use this type inference, but in the compiler case the application actually has three arguments. So you the application itself will have an A in here. And in the compiler case it's the job of the type inference. You for basically first run type inference on the whole thing before you have to type check. And it's job of type inference to fill in this A. Because you you know you, it's, it's just in the compiler, it's more natural to separate uh, type inference from type checking. And this is kind of a way to combine them in a single step, which makes more sense in the interactive setting. And here is another example. This is the example from the compiler domain. So if, if, if you want to include the CPS transformation in your compiler, and so it is an option in our compiler, you just um, you, you write the transformations for individual, uh, for individual constructs in your language. So this defines. CPS for variables, CPS for let expressions, CPS for applications. And in fact, so I don't want you to spend much time trying to understand what exactly the rules are saying here. But it is an interesting fact that uh, we basically derode these rules by just taking one of the standard papers on how you do CPS and encoding them in our language. The only thing we, we, we did is we added types. So the paper was for CPS for untyped lambda calculus. And we said, well, we want to keep types for as long as we can. Uh, so we added types. But other than that, this, this is just direct translation. And so then for all the rules, you're, we annotate them. 
saying add them to the essentially to the lookup table for CPS, and that lookup table uh, is created, and the whole CPS resource is created by just one line uh, invocation of the helper function for creating lookup table the resources based on lookup table, and then all you have to do uh, for to 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 implement the CPS tactic is essentially to say keep uh, be right in your program according to this uh, to this resource so, and so you just uh, essentially to implement CPS you or say for is to implement if you if you're adding a new language construct uh, to your compiler and one of the big goals for doing compiler in this way was so that um, you can extend your language easily and so that there is some hope that your extensions are, are conservative. Because in traditional compilers, when you add new features, you, especially if you, you know, in the research setting, if you have a student add a new feature, it's very likely that five other features will break. And so here is the core place to have this research compiler where there is some hope that extensions are conservative. But anyway, so if you're adding a new language construct, and the only thing you have to do in order to tell the compiler how to do CPS is just you, you write the rule, you annotate it with this, and you're done. So it's basically, it's, it's higher order abstract syntax. Well, um, this whole thing with resources is one of the big contributions. And uh, our, so our higher order abstract syntax is quite different from Isabel's. And Isabel's is sort of much more verbose. So um, and we, we really try for, for our higher order abstract syntax, we really try to set it up so that it's very expressive yet very concise. Yeah, and it's also easy to catch the most common typos. And so the the higher so in Isabel the so the, the abstract syntax is typed. In our case the, the syntax is untyped and you would have to basically to say much less to to do the same. There are some there are some trade offs obviously but we believe that our syntax is um, much easier to work with. And, right, and so, you know, the, the, the other contribution is being able to, uh, to do all of this, like this lookup tables with as little typing as possible. It's like, here you just type you know, what, uh, nine symbols to hell with the CPS rule. And, and more importantly, you don't have to really uh, know much about how the whole thing is set up. So you just say it's a CPS role. You don't need to know how CPS is implemented, really. You just need to know as much as, uh, you just need to know as much as needed to be able to explain how to transform whatever construct you're adding, and then you say it's a CPS rule, and whoever wrote the CPS rule, the, the, whoever wrote the CPS tactic, also wrote the, so the, this annotation processor that knows what, what being a CPS rule means and how it is supposed to be used. So it's essentially um, trying to find a proper interface so that no matter what task you're working on and what it is exactly that you're implementing, you don't need to know too much about the rest of the system. So there is no kind of hidden invariance about how parts of the system 
interact, or at least there is few, as few of those hidden assumptions as possible. So, and the, you can, the hope is that you can add, uh, if, if you want to, you can add more tests to the processor of annotation so that if you wrote something that looks like a reasonable CPS rule but violates some uh, assumptions of the CPS stage, it will be just rejected. And for example, for the, again, for the decomposition tactic, if you try to annotate intro on something that's not a proper introduction rule, it will say, no, uh, this, is, this is not what I know how to deal with. And there are more examples. So you, there is a, in the type theory, there is, uh, you know, there, there, there is a tactic that just reduces expressions, essentially. Computes expressions, and again, you, uh, when you prove an equivalence of this form that you want to use in your, essentially in your simplifier, you just say, use it. So here on the other hand, um, you do have to know one implicit assumption, which is that it's the job of whoever, uh, at, whoever decides to write this to make sure that there are no cycles. So the reduce itself does not, so it attempts to be really fast, but it does not attempt to detect cycles. So it's, again, it's just a trade-off that we decided on. And not, not only tactics so can be implemented using resources. There are many other things uh, that we implement using this resource mechanism. Um, in, and one example is type inference. And both in both the type inference heuristic, both the type inference heuristic in the type theory, in uh, in the theorem for and the type inference in the compiler are implemented in sort of this this way. They're slightly different, obviously. Uh, again, because assumptions in one assumes it's just a heuristic, and it should just if it's not obvious what it needs to do. It should just try something that might work. And uh, the type inference in case of the compiler just implements the standard algorithm. Uh, but again, so the idea here is that you split uh, the you split the concerns. So instead of having to write one single type inference that knows how to infer the type of everything, uh, whenever you add something new, you just have to explain how to do type inference for that particular new operation. And here is one simple example. The real thing, so type inference is pretty complicated, so the, uh, the, the real thing is, um, is a bit more complicated, but the general idea is sort of the same. And uh, there is what a tactic, and this what a tactic is very useful when you just add some relatively new theory or a relatively new set of rules, yeah, and you don't really know what the good al what good proof search algorithms are for this. You just want to do a simple try a lot of uh, simple things heuristic. And what is just a collection of simple things you might want to try? Or not so simple. Uh, in the uh, in the theorem prover, things like um, first order automated prover will be part of this auto tactic. Because again, this is first order automated prover is something that. You can. It's, it's worth trying, no matter what it is exactly that you're really proving. No matter what it, what's the underlying interesting part of the theory. If for some reason whatever you're trying, trying to prove just follows from first order logic, it doesn't hurt to try using that. Well, the resource is the one that provides the list. 
the user just provides individual simple things, and the resource makes sure that they are collected in, in the list in, according to this uh, tier inheritance hierarchy. And so when you, when you uh, provide, when you add a new one, you give it a precedence so that then it knows how to sort this list. Because while for, um, you know, for the decomposition tactic, it does make sense to say when, whenever you have many things to try, just try the, the latest one. Um, in, in most cases, this is the right thing to do. And something like that, you obviously want more control. And so let me summarize it a bit. So over the last eight or so years, we, we spent a lot of time developing these mechanisms and, and trying to make sure that we do it so that the tactics we write are as extensible as possible, they respect scoping, they're as efficient as possible, and most importantly, they're as easy to use as possible. And most of what we did was not uh, was not that we would sit down and think, well, what are the you know, let's and think, let's try to come up with interesting ways of constructing tactics. Most of it uh, would come from from the users. So the users will say and come and say it's silly that I have to keep adding rules uh, to the intro resource when all the information is already there. And we would implement this resource annotation mechanism and, and so forth. And so there are a lot of uh, basic tactics. So tactics like de decomposition tactic, auto, and reduce, they're not uh, specific to any particular theory. As I said, DT is used both in the theorem improver, where it's one of probably the most commonly used tactic. It's also used to implement type checking in the compiler. And similar reduce is used in the compiler as a way to simplify the programs in certain cases. Also, the, these, these kind of mechanisms are used to implement all kind of helper tools. Type inference was the one that I showed. The one that I didn't show is that the preacher printer uh, is implemented using these mechanisms. You basically, when you add, say, a new operator and you want to tell the system how to pretty print it, you just, again, it, you give it enough information about pretty printing this particular operator and it um, combines them in this lookup table and in, in each theory it will uh, use the appropriate pretty printing. And again, because this is this lookup table that respects the and the resource respects the theory hierarchy, it is possible to shadow things so, and have the same thing displayed differently in different theories. If in your theory you use some standard operator uh, in some non-standard way and you want to display it accordingly. So it's, it's straightforward. And, and of course the uh, the compiler itself, uh, where so with the compiler, the 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 reason uh, the reason for doing it one one of the reasons, as I said, is to try to make sure that it's easy to extend the language in this kind of research setting when people come in try to add new features, not necessarily uh, they don't necessarily know. Uh, how the whole compiler is set up, and they don't necessarily want to know how the whole compiler is set up. They just want to know as little as possible about the rest of the compiler, and so this mechanism, these mechanisms help a lot. And the other reason is because most of the compiler is just a tactic. We have this guarantee that if the formal rules that we wrote down are correct then no matter what the rest of the compiler will do, if, uh, if, if, if 
you get an assembly program at the end, you know it's equivalent to the original one. And the, the rules that you do have to trust in order to trust the whole thing, they're written in this, you know, uh, this higher level math-like language. Very often they're just a direct translation of a paper or a textbook. And so the hope is for somebody who understands program language semantics, not necessarily even the compiler, not necessarily even understands compiler, but just understands program language semantics, it should be relatively easy to just look at the rules and informally confirm that they are correct. And even if they are not, if you do manage to get into a state where the uh, where the, comp the compiler does something wrong, uh, it's easy to figure out where to put the blame. Because you know that this means that one of the rules was run, and you don't have to go and check the rest of the code when doing debugging. And also, uh, one interesting thing that we found out is that while the compiler is obviously a fully automated thing, you don't want your compiler to come back to you and ask, well, can you give me a hint uh, as to how to compile your program? The fact that this whole thing is done uh, together with this interactive theorem proving setup it turns out to be a really great debugging tool. Uh, one thing, uh, the, the, the theorem prover provides all this really nice functionality to add pretty printing really easily, so it's easy to examine sort of the intermediate stages of what your compiler is doing. Again, because it's a theorem prover, it can just build the whole proof, and then you can examine, so in case of, of a compiler, it can sort of build, build the log of how it got from the source program to wherever it, it have gotten, and you can see what happened and find bugs this way. It's very easy to go in interactively and say, okay, let's take this sub-program and let's apply this uh, small stage of the compiler to it and show me how that works. So you know, it's very easy to examine little pieces of your compiler tactic. So it turns out that even if you're only interested in fully automated, automated uh, proof search, the fact that you have an interactive system helps a lot in writing those fully automated proof search uh, tactics. So, yes, questions? Yes, so we have a compiler, um, mostly we, um, we, we, we serve, we still treat it at this, as this research Thing. So we keep breaking it by because we, we keep we essentially keep trying uh, different approaches in different cases. So, uh, but it is there. Yeah. Once every two months, it's actually in some semi-complete state where things work. Well, yeah, meta. So we, we call it MMC, but we haven't decided what exactly MMC stands for, whether it's Mojave Metabrol Compiler or Mojave Meta Compiler or... In a way, it's also a compiler. It's, a comp it's de depending on how you look at it. It's either a framework for building a compiler or it's a concrete compiler that's built using that framework. The concrete, but still extensible and flexible, and so forth. You, you might be able to. You, so I, we we decided to start with uh, with implementing a compiler of sort of ML-like language because it's easier, and we at this stage we're not interested as much in com compiler for a concrete language as in making sure this framework actually works and gives you what you want to get out of it. But uh, um, 
So be, because it's the idea is that it's completely extensible, adding new languages, new language features shouldn't be a big problem. It would be interesting to get a compiler this way. Compare it to the end product. So it's it, it's a it's a bit different in a way that uh, it the the the, sort of the metrics that this way of doing optimizes are not the same ones that you know. So, for example, the compilation time is probably won't be as fast. The developing time could be faster because it has so much of this built-in functionality, and all this, the, all, and all the features that I didn't mention, the features that are provided by this higher-order abstract syntax, are really, really useful for building a compiler. So, as a, as a tool for building a compiler, it can give you uh, a, a, comp a compiler very quickly. So, it may not necessarily be the best way to do a production compiler, but if you just want to, if you're developing a language or thinking about adding new features to a language, or there is some other, basically, research reason where you expect to spend a lot of time modifying the compiler, and you want the framework where that's flexible enough to allow you to keep experimenting with your compiler, then uh, definitely something worth considering. Right. You get something that's inconsistent. Basically, the only the only support that exists is that when you prove a theorem, you can ask, list me all the axioms that this proof depends on. And it's up to the user not to create an inconsistent set of axioms. I guess the, only, the, the, the main support is that there are some Obviously, that there are some theories that are already there for which we're reasonably sure that they're consistent. Well, as much as you can be sure about this, these kind of things for complicated theories. But it's not the generalization. So you say a piece of A can do the axioms. No, no, no. No, no. So a piece of data will be like a proof. So a piece of data is something that you that has some kind of formal or semi-formal meaning. And you want to manipulate it in a very restricted way. So in case of a theorem pr prover, the piece of data is this partial proof that you're building. But you may want to make sure that the only way to build this partial, to, you know, to keep building this partial proof and to you know, eventually get to a complete one is by applying one of the rules. Same way with the compiler. So the piece of data is the program that you're compiling. And you want to make sure that the only way to modify this program is by going through one of these well-defined rules. You could, you you could probably do it this way, yeah. So there seems to be many other applications. Say. For example, yeah. right. So, right. You could, you could, I, you could probably formalize yeah, these sort of the standard again textbook rules, and then to say that's it. The only thing that you're allowed to use is one of those rules. So the rules do take arguments, and they do. You can give those rules a lot of information. You can write tactics to apply. Food in order to apply these rules in a smart way, and there is a guarantee that if you formalize the basic rules correctly, you won't be able to compute your integrals incorrectly. There is no obstacle to that. The requirement is to reduce rules and not require a secret. But this is supposed to be one. But 
but the reduce C is just one of the many tactics. You're not required to use it. You can set e, you can set up your own tactics and your own resources. So it's just uh, reduce is just one of the things that we have. There is nothing special about reduce. There is nothing that says that you can have your own reduce that has some sort of metric or heuristic for, for deciding when to do some modification and when not to. There are several uh, uh, text based tools around that say the uh, on top of so it's 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 kind of depressing the way uh, most people in the that that are using these pores they know one of them and they really don't care what happens in communities around other pores. So for me. It, and I don't claim to be an exception to that rule. So I, I try to, to at least, you know, have some idea, but I won't call myself an expert in, on anything other than MetaPro or Nico. That relates to the other question I want to ask. Uh, why is it so good? There is such a stigma that it's very hard to invest an awful lot of effort in understanding the limitations So there are a few people that understand a few of them, and some of them think Metapro is one of most uh, perspective at least, but he has the most potential. But I don't know if that is true. Is there a vote for other there, users? So one one thing that we that we did try a lot, and uh, so. There is a very good reason for this ease of use uh, to be here is that these mechanisms, they do decrease the learning curve a lot. So we, you know, we try to make sure that the things that we do are as intuitive and as accessible as possible. So and, uh, I, 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 at Caltech, I taught a couple of small courses in that at, um, um, undergraduate students mostly uh, that were based on the system and I used their basically I used the feedback from that to see what can be done about the system to make it as accessible to people as possible. So I cannot speak for communities around other zero employers, but on the medical side we're definitely concerned um, about making it so that it's really easy to start using this. Maybe not, you know, the full functionality, but at least for the basic functionality is very accessible and natural and as intuitive as you can make it. Thank you again. Okay.